Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath us are God's everlasting arms. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. You who believe in me, even though you were dead, yet shall you live again. For whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Let us pray. Eternal God, you love us with an everlasting love, and you can turn the shadow of death into the dawn of a new morning. Speak to us of the eternal things, that we may be lifted into the light and the peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good afternoon, and welcome to this memorial service for Steve Voidenoff. Oh, we lost a good one, didn't we? It's a sad occasion to be together, but it's not only sad, for today we also celebrate God's presence in Steve's life. And in that regard, there is a great deal to celebrate. So we are sad and celebratory at the same time. On behalf of Steve's family, let me welcome you and say your presence here is very much appreciated. We'll be having a reception following this service in our fellowship hall, which is over in this part of the facility. And what we don't do is form a formal receiving line. So immediately following this service, the family will make their way out to our memorial garden, which is right out here. And we'll have a brief internment. And while that's all going on, if everyone else would just make your way back to the fellowship hall, go have some refreshments, and as soon as we're done, we'll bring the family in and you can greet them at your convenience. Claudia, a few words of welcome from Steve's widow, Claudia. Yeah. There it is, the day I knew it would come. And without God, I could not do it. I hope you agree with me that God is right here right now. At least he is carrying me right now. Thank you for all, all of you coming here today. It means the world to me and our family. And if you know that Steve and I in 2009 stood right there in this aisle when he proposed to me in front of God and the congregation, and I said yes, and then a year later we were standing right there. And Pastor Phil Reed married us. It was a very small ceremony. My kids were there, Nicole came, and our witnesses, and it's, it's a little bit awkward for me to, to see this picture there right now. And I'm wearing the same dress again that I wore when I got married to Steve. I, I want to tell you what the four-year-old that I babysit said when he came to my house and saw the picture of Steve. He stood there in awe, and he said, Miss Claudia, look, he's in heaven. Can you see that? He is. You all know that. And if he's not, I'm not going either. So, that being said, I will not have the opportunity to talk to each and everybody of you, but just know I'm grateful you are here for me today. I thank everybody who supported me in the last nine months. And let's celebrate Steve's life, all right? The next piece of music you will hear is from Johann Sebastian Bach. And Growing up as a child, having a mom and a dad who played in a symphonic orchestra all their life, my mom the cello, my dad the violin, recorded that in 1973. The quality might not be up to 2019 standard of purity, but this is what I need to hear right now to make it through this service. And once again, thank you for being here. 
you all please stand and let us join together in the prayer of confession that is printed in the bulletin. Loving and joyous God, you are our starting point and our haven. All of life begins and ends with you. We celebrate that though death can end a life, it cannot end a relationship. For things we should have done or said but did not, forgive us. For things we did and said but should not have, forgive us. Give us peace that we may heal and rejoice, celebrate and grieve in your holy ways, through Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God, amen. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And as our custom, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Please be seated.
Hear now the word of God as it comes from both the Old and the New Testaments, Psalm 23 and the Gospel according to John. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be as well. And whither I go you know, and the way you know, for I am the way and the truth and the life. Amen. We have two family remembrances from Nolan and Philip, and if you guys will make your way up here, that would be great. And then two eulogies to follow. This is Nolan. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. It's really amazing to see all of you showed up today to show their respects, to show how many people cared for this man. I thank each and every one of you for being here on this day with us. And what I know is a day my dad would not want us to, to remember the good, or would want us to re- use to remember the good times, not focus on the sad fact that he is gone. Stephen Philip Voidnoff, your brother, your uncle, your cousin, your friend, our father was one in a million, maybe billion. If the world had more people like him in it, I can really say it'd be a better place. Did my dad have his flaws? Yes, of course, like everyone does. But did he always strive to do his best, do right by others? Would he not have given the shirt off his back to help out a stranger? We all know these answers, and this is most likely why you're here. He was the kind of guy who would have gave you that shirt, and in return only asked that you pay that kindness forward. His generosity came without conditions. He was born August 23rd, 1957, and on that day the world was given a gift. My grandma Helen and grandfather Risty, rest in peace. And hey guys, take care of my pops up there. Hey, when my grandparents raised my dad alongside his very mostly loving and supporting brothers and sisters. Now he got into the usual shenanigans like most kids and teenagers do with his buddies. Some of you I see now, and I've heard some stories. You know who you are. And with time and him growing up, he figured out what it is to be a man. These things, these mannerisms, his behaviors, his principles, are what made him beyond what most of us are capable of. Now, although I haven't always applied this to my personal decision making, my dad showed me what it was to be a great man and one heck of a father. Whether it was him playing catch with me after a long day of work or playing this game with my brother and sister we invented called Zombie, He just put a sheet over his head and would chase us around. And I know it doesn't sound like anything amazing, but I remember that as being one of my best childhood memories. When I was around five, my dad would have to wake up every day at 4.30 to drive out to work. Being his age and doing what he did, I'm not sure how every morning, oh, by the way, I'd be up this time watching my Mr. Wizard, waiting for him to leave to say bye. But every morning, when most people don't want anything to do with anyone, My dad would get up smiling, ready for the day, ready for work, but he never left without saying, I love you, tiger. 
No matter his struggles, he set aside his problems to look after others. He would do anything for his family and friends. With his actions, he showed me the way to conduct myself, how I should treat people, what's right, what's wrong, how to handle most situations. He wasn't fake, he was genuine, and he cared about the ones he knew. On September 23rd, when he was diagnosed, that's one day I'm always going to remember. If there's something in this world called fair, this doesn't help with saying there's anything out there like that. This couldn't have happened to a better person. I couldn't believe it, I didn't want to. However, my dad being the guy he was, right after being told he had probable weeks to live, told me this. It's going to be okay. What's meant to be is meant to be. It's not a goodbye because I'll see you again one day. I'm just going home. He was so strong in so many ways right up until the end. And although there's not many items left to remember him by, I'll always have the memories, interactions, lessons, and skills, the adventures that him and I experienced together. My dad was right by my side my entire life, and I did my best to be there for him. We would do anything for each other. I'm blessed to say I, have a, I had a great relationship with him, and it's really hard to know I won't be able to ever talk to my best friend, my dad, ever again. June 21st, another date that I'll no longer forget. On that morning, God decided Steve was probably too good for this world and called him up to heaven. I was honored to be there by his side when this time came. I just hope the words I spoke to him gave him some comfort in those moments as a small, small repayment to him for always being there by my side. I love you, Dad. I look forward to seeing you again. Every day is a struggle, but I'll do my best to make you proud and keep moving on like you always told me to do. I'll miss you, Pops. With that all said, thanks again, everyone, for coming. And remember, Steve would want this to be a day of joy, a time to remember the good stuff. Maybe have a couple drinks and share some stories. Remember those times that you had with my dad and keep them in your hearts, just like he kept us all in his. That's all I would have wanted. Thank you. Put it on my phone. <laughs> Family and friends, thank you all for being here today. And an extra thank you, extra special thank you to my wonderful mom who had recommended against some of the jokes I had prepared because they were, quote, inappropriate. <laughs> we're all here today because we shared some of the time of our lives with somebody special. Maybe it was your Little League softball or baseball coach, that familiar hardworking face, uh, the familiar, hardworking, uh, black coffee drinking, friendly face at your local grocery store, or your bowling buddy perhaps, uh, or that party animal up in Port Austin, passed out on Oak Beach, <laughs> Captain Steve Z's of the Pinnabog River. <laughs> but for Nolan and Nicole and myself, um, he was dad. Uh, the dad who every morning before school would scoop us up from bed, plop us on the couch with a bowl of Fruit Loops for cartoons, uh, the dad who would chase, around, chase us around at night with the blanket on our head playing zombie. It, w it was so good that we obviously both put it in. <laughs> uh, and the dad who would work to solve any problem that you brought him. It's pretty obvious that the more time you spend with someone, the better you can understand them, uh, their character, whether their interests are, their personalities. And for most, it didn't take long for being around Steve to pick up on that sense of humor or his carefree uh, attitude towards some things at times but he might not have known how skilled of a handyman he was, how reliable he was when you called on him with a problem, or how hard he would work towards something that he believed in. A very good number of years ago, while living just a few roads over on Stout Street, we'd, we'd, we'd repeatedly talk about plans to remodel and finish the basement. My dad frequently would discuss his, his skills and efforts in constructing the house itself. Um, and at the time, the basement was just a cold concrete room full of toys, weird carpet patches, strange smells, and occasionally mysterious puddles. Sorry. Melting up here. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> as a kid, I wasn't exactly sure I had much sway in the conversation regarding the basement renovations, but I participated as it was genuinely interesting to plan and think about. I'm honestly fuzzy, a little fuzzy on how we got started exactly, but one day, he decided to make the frame of a wall in the corner of the basement. 
It was a start, but that sole wall stood there for a number of months just waiting for something else. Uh, my initial job would then become to poke the bear, if you will, in the hopes that it would make him act. Uh, and <laughs> uh, when he started buying materials and supplies again, the project took off, a testament to just how hard he'd work at something. This was almost every day after he'd gotten home from work. Each day, each afternoon, and into the night, we'd inch our way along step by step, piece by piece, and as we continued, he began to find ways to include me on things like running electrical wires, plumbing, ductwork, drywalling, the whole shebang. Uh, it's like, <laughs> like Nixon. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> all along the way, he'd take the time to explain what he was doing, and maybe more importantly, he'd, he'd take the time to answer all the weird questions that I could come up with. And if any of you know me, I come up with a fair amount of weird questions. Watching and working with him was an incredibly insightful experience. His knowledge in the process validated all those dad stories about him building the house, and his, and work ethic, his determination and work ethic would be the example I'd carry with me through my life. We would work to finish the basement, and, in those, and those that were able to visit the stout house before and after certainly know how much work went into it. In those couple of years working on the basement together, I learned a lot about trade skills and the value of hard, working hard, setting goals, staying motivated, but only in hindsight would I be able to recognize this time spent together as one of the most memorable and fondest experiences we would share. As the three of us continued to grow up, we would each develop wildly different interests and personalities from one another. I'd assume with most parents of teenage kids, mom and dad would both have their work cut out for them. During these years, the three of us would have our own challenges with mom and dad. Uh, and for Dad and I, it was ultimately our communication that we would struggle with. It was impossible, even looking back, to pinpoint a moment where things would become more challenging for us. But as we grew up, I began to take on other interests, and our paths would continue to diverge. I suppose it should have been apparent then, but because Steve worked so hard uh, at what he believed in, he would never let our relationship completely freeze over. Knowing some of my interests were in technology, he'd worked to connect with me over his ability to, quote, log in to the Kroger computer and make orders. <laughs> Always proudly telling me that his password for work is philip1, <laughs> which, just as a side note, is not a secure password. Please do not use that. It was also his middle name, too, so it didn't, was not very good. Uh, he didn't care, though. He was only interested in talking, maybe spending a few moments of his time with one of his sons. Around this time, I'd move away for college for a few years, and our communication would continue to suffer. I've learned this lesson in a, costly, in a costly way, but when you stop communicating, it strains almost all aspects of any kind of relationship. It prevents meaningful conversations from happening, and it hardens our perspectives, right or wrong. We would continue to reach out, he would continue to reach out, just looking for a few minutes to chat about what was going on. It pains me to look back at our text conversations, how shallow and one-sided they had become over the years. And while we would have the opportunity to talk about it, there are still some things I'm certainly, there are still some things I certainly would have approached and handled differently. I'm not sure the conclusions we would arrive on all of the differences we had developed. Honestly, it was only after we learned of the slow-moving tragedy that our relationship would truly begin to thaw. However, we would learn this time together that if we focused our, our efforts on one of the things we had in common and not our differences, that those conclusions wouldn't really matter in the end. It was a delicate relationship, but it was certainly worth having. He worked hard at what he believed in. I can see now it didn't matter if it was a basement or giving up on a son who was trying to pull away. We only learned of the situation eight or nine months ago, and each week after that, our special event together would be getting breakfast. We would use the time to discuss everything from the cold years to the, what stocks were looking promising. We'd then cruise around and listen to music, the Blues Brothers, We'd chill at my place and watch a movie, mainly the Blues Brothers, and we'd reminisce about good times past. He would frequently say, there would be good days and bad days, and as the weeks grew more difficult, his spirit would stay strong, along with that sense of humor, too. I learned a lot from him, the latest being reminded that time is everyone's most precious and valuable resource. I hope every once in a while we make sure that we ask ourselves if we're using it wisely. My dad and I had a lot of good memories, and a handful of bad ones. I'm convinced that's life. Not everything is going to be perfect. If it was, you wouldn't be able to know the difference. Between the lessons, his sense of humor, his hard work ethic, knowledgeability, 
dedication to what he believed in, and the time we did and didn't spend together. I will miss him. Thank you. everyone. Um, I'm here to share a very important part of Steve's life with you today. And, you know, it's, it's an honor and privilege to do this. Um, for you, those of you who may not know me, I'm Michael Zakarian. And Steve and I go way back, back to our youth. We both have Macedonian heritage. And uh, our grandfathers actually came from the same area in Macedonia, just a couple different villages few miles away and they helped each other when they came to America and turns out Steve and I just grew up a few blocks away so it was pretty ironic so one fact I wanted to share with you about Steve is that he always had a passion for studying the Bible in fact after high school he intended to become a Macedonian priest he studied at a seminary in New York but God had other plans for Steve he came back home started a family and spent his career at Kroger now, it's quickly evident to anyone, any of you who ever met Steve, to see that he loved people. He had such an infectious smile and a heartfelt laugh. You can just hear it right now. It touched all of our lives. And look at how many people are here gathered to here today. He loved a sellout crowd, too, so it's wonderful. You know, remarkably, he kept that smile and his love for people when Steve's courage and faith were called upon when he found out that his life would forever be changed. And my friend Steve knew that this day was coming. So he asked me to be with, here, be with you all, all of you here today because he wants all of you to know what was deep inside of him that allowed him to continue to keep that smile. So please allow me to share Steve's true heart with all of you. That really seemed like yesterday, but it was nine months ago Steve asked me to meet with him. I can remember him looking at me and he said, Zach! Yeah, no, not many people can call me Zach anymore, but Steve always did, and so is Claudia. He said, I want you to give my eulogy for me when I'm gone. I'm like, what is he talking about? As you can imagine, in that moment, I was, it was very unsettling uh, to hear your dear friend discuss the end of his life with you. But I felt honored that Steve trusted me to share his deepest thoughts. He said, please tell everyone that I'm sure of where I'm going after I pass. And he wanted everyone to know who he put his trust in and where he would spend eternity. Steve and I always shared a special bond of our faith in God together. It's really both tragic and wonderful at the same time that Steve was at peace knowing his destination was predetermined because of his devotion to and his choice to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now this was so powerful because Steve had an assurance knowing that in his heart God's living word was truth and was unchangeable. Nothing could change it for him. Now, having this guarantee, it truly deepened his faith. He had decided to let go of control, something we really have a hard time with in this world, but he decided to let go of control, stop all the treatments, and allow God to take over. So having confidence in knowing that God's plan and will for his life would happen in God's divine timing. Wow, this is faith and courage in action. For all of you here today, especially as children, it's important for you to know that Steve was demonstrating the very definition of faith and trust from the Bible. I wanted to share a scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. 
For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. And within this scripture, Steve didn't see Jesus yet, but he loved and believed in him, which allowed him to have that joy and peace, despite his circumstances, circumstances, as he moved through his physical challenges. And I believe Steve expressed this joy in his last days here, being able to deepen his relationships with Claudia and his children. is really a wonderful thing to see. Ultimately, Steve received the end of his faith, the end of that verse. He received the end of his faith, which was the salvation of his soul. We all know that now. So what a gift it would be for all of us. And this is really what he spoke to me about. If we could only live with this assurance and the joy in the here and now, right here, right now, without having any challenges in our life. Having that sense of confidence and peace and truly knowing our salvation and eternal life were taken care of. This was Steve's authentic heart. Steve wanted his loved ones to know that the only way to the Father was through his one and only Son, Jesus Christ. He would want you to have this assurance, I know that, and take the wonderful journey he took to understand the truth of God's Word. So this is the gift that he leaves for his family and all of us, his friends, who had the pleasure of loving and being loved by this wonderful man. So I say thank you, Steve. Thank you for that very special gift that you provided to me to honor your life and to share it with all your friends and family. So God bless every one of you. Stephen Philip Voidenoff was born August 23, 1957, and he died June 21, 2019. We grieve his death and celebrate the presence of God in his life. We celebrate his life in words and ways that only hint at who he was and how we feel about him. But we all know there was something special about Steve. I'm going to try to name that and say that's where God was present in his life. I believe God is present in every life. Not all of us are aware of that, but Steve was certainly aware of God's presence. Here's where I experienced God through Steve. When you were around Steve, he lifted you up. Some people drain you. Some people diminish your enthusiasm. Some people deplete you. Not Steve. Steve had a contagious spirit. He gave you energy. He gave you excitement. He gave you enthusiasm. He lifted you up. You know what? That's why God made him. That's exactly why God made him. God makes people like Steve to come into our lives and lift us. Steve was born in Dearborn, second of six children. He loved sports that continued throughout his entire life. Today we thank God for Steve's growing up years, for his schooling, for his friends, for his family. In many ways we become the person that was in seed form when we were little. And we all know that some of the seeds don't blossom into beautiful plants, but when they do, we thank God for that. Steve was probably a little crazy in high school, who wasn't. Cars and music and all the other things that dominate a teenage boy's attention. I think Steve's first car was a Camaro. Doesn't that fit? 
As Steve grew up, I think he maintained an appropriate level of craziness. You know, he really wasn't a Russian spy. <laughs> Am I the only one Steve told that to? I thought he was confessing when he... That's the way Steve was. He looked to lift you up, to lighten your load. Steve did go to seminary for a time after high school, and he figured out pretty quickly that seminary wasn't quite right for him, but that says a lot about him. People that go to seminary don't go because they're especially religious. They go because they want to help other people. They want to help people at the deepest level of being a human being. They're interested in their hearts. They're interested in their souls. And they think somehow seminary will help them help other people. But you know, sometimes the religious stuff gets in all the way. But what we want to say today is that even though Steve didn't finish seminary, he became a priest in the sense that he mediated God's presence because he lifted you up. Steve also worked as a stockbroker in Detroit. Did you know that? He figured out that wasn't quite right either. And then Kroger came calling. And Steve started in stock in Dearborn and stayed with Kroger the rest of his life. He was grocery manager in Dearborn, Ann Arbor, Woodhaven, here on Gross Eel. And I always had the feeling that for Steve, his job was more than a job. It was a calling. There's something holy about helping people to eat, even if this is the way that you make your living. Eating is more than just a biological necessity. Families come together around a table. Loved ones eat together. Friends eat together. When we share a meal, it's more than just sharing food. We're sharing ourselves. Important conversations happen when we eat together. Jesus made a big deal about the people he ate with. And you know what? Jesus ate with all the wrong people. He ate with tax collectors. He ate with sinners. And all the religious people who had gone to seminary gave him grief for it. But for Jesus, it was incredibly important about who you eat with, because there's something holy in eating. I had my best conversations with Steve in the aisles at Kroger. My wife has a knack for putting one impossible thing on every grocery list. You know, something that there's only one or two of in the store, and nobody knows where it is except the grocery manager. It's stuck way at uh, below eye level, it's in a little jar. Milk, bread, eggs, capers with no salt. <laughs> Steve, do you have any capers that are salt free? I'm not the only person that Steve helped. As he helped me frequently, we would talk, and Steve had a knack of getting right to it, right? He, he didn't mince around when you knew you were going to have a brief conversation. He talked meaningfully and genuinely right away. We talked about what was going on and what his life was like, and what he was concerned about and what he was joyous about. And I can tell you for a fact that family was number one for him. In this world, a lot of us get diverted especially men, other things become as important. But for Steve, it was family. And Steve would always want to know how I was doing. And he wasn't asking in a perfunctory way. He really wanted to know. He would listen carefully and thoughtfully. There's a lot of people who when you start to talk about yourself, they relate it to themselves, and then they start talking about themselves. And, but Steve wasn't like that at all. 
he would listen, cared about you. He lifted you up. So we thank God for Steve's working years. He had a busy job. We thank God that Steve did his work well with honesty and integrity. We thank God for the way he interacted with his colleagues and his supervisors, those he supervised. We thank God for the way he interacted with his customers. He attended to them. There's something holy about all that. We thank God for Steve's family. We thank God for the marriage that produced three children, Nolan, Philip, and Nicole. We thank God for his marriage to Claudia. We thank God for the person Steve was in his family. He loved sports and he shared this love with his kids. He coached their baseball teams and softball teams. And you gotta admire the dad who volunteers to coach because there's nothing easy about that. He played with the kids at home. Play, got down on the floor and played with him. Took him out in the backyard or wherever and played with him. He taught them or he tried to teach them life's most important lessons. That's his legacy. He lifted them up. And what we all need to know is that this is the kind of love that does not end. It does reach beyond death into eternity. You will always have the love of your dad with you. And Steve was a splendid guy. Very handy around a house. He knew how to tile. He knew how to do drywall mud. There's a real art to that. It's not easy. Steve was determined, as you heard. He kept working on what he believed in. Boydnoff's never quit. He loved the stars. Steve would take the family up to Port Arthur. They'd spend hours gazing at the stars. What's up there, he would wonder. He loved the travel. Claudia and Steve had a trip of a lifetime to Macedonia, where his family was from. It was glorious for Steve. Steve was also a little quirky. He had this habit of picking up cans wherever he found them. <laughs> Even if he had to stop the car and have somebody in the car pick it up. He was a bit frugal, turned him in, made a little money. When you work hard for your money, you get like that. Steve had an outstanding baseball card collection and he loved coins. He was a faithful guy. Boy, I really miss him here. He worshiped here and there were many Sunday mornings when Steve would take his break at Kroger, come to church, and then go right back to work. I had appreciated that because it said where his heart was. Praise God for Steve's faith. And we praise God for how Steve faced his diagnosis and how he met death with courage. You know, it's not about the good times. They're nice, but who are you when the going gets rough? Who are you when the train goes off the tracks? Who are you? when you are facing the greatest of challenges. That may be who you really are. And if you're in that spot, and you don't get bitter, and don't get angry, but instead, lift people That means that God is with you. Thank God for Steve. 
Thank God for all the good that passes from his life into ours. Thank God that Steve lifted us all up. And thank God that Steve is now lifted up himself through the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. O God, giver of life and lover of our souls, open up for us just a window on eternity, a glimpse of glory, because right now in this prayer, we release this one, Steve, loved by you and by us, to be in your care in the promise of life forevermore. We celebrate the moments past, sanctify the memories. May they sweeten the hearts of those who hold them as we await in joyful hope that day of promise when there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, because these things have passed away. In the meantime, we have hope. And we praise your goodness for all Steve meant to us. May every prayer, every tear be transformed by your miraculous presence into a gift of joy and may every memory become a blessing of gratitude. In Christ, the victor over death and the grave, we pray. Amen. Goodbye, Steve. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit These blessings are with you now, and they always are. Amen and amen.